Hello, everybody. I wanted to uh, welcome you to Fruitful Trees and let you know I've been doing a lot of interviews with a lot of people lately. And, you know, mango season's just around the corner. And I am so excited about mango season, but I'm also excited about the knowledge that people are sharing about mangoes. And today on the show, I went to interview Jonathan Crane, who probably knows more about mangoes than just about anyone else around these days. He's actually from the University of Florida Research Center for Tropical Fruits. So not only mangoes, but he knows about all these different fruits. But today on the show, I have him and we're talking about mangoes. And I asked him a lot of questions and he gave me a lot of answers. So I'll put his contact information below, but here we go with Jonathan Crane from Trek, the Research Center for Tropical Fruit from South Florida. Okay, so here we are with your mangoes here. So tell us about uh, the different varieties of mangoes you have and the different research you're doing with mangoes. Sure. This is the uh, Trek University of Florida collection of mangoes. We've got about 180 different varieties. And we are standing here in front of actually a Tommy Atkins tree. And the reason we're in front of this tree is because we want to talk a little bit about the flowering and fruit set this year. In general, the flowering was pretty good. We had two blooms but the fruit set has been horrendously poor. During the first bloom, it coincided with a cold period, actually cold weather down here. We got down to about 34 degrees one night, 37 degrees the next night, and we had some cool other temperatures. And we know that temperatures below about 40 degrees can actually damage the embryo of the mango. And so what happened was that cold damage to that during that flowering period resulted in very, very little fruit set. However, that cold period also enabled shoots that did not flower for the first flowering to flower on the second flowering. However, very little of that has set as well. I can't say that that may, is due to weather, perhaps disease, increased disease pressure, and the fact that not that much new bloom did come out from that, that cold period. So this year, um, there may be exceptions, and I'm sure there are, but in general, we have very, very little fruit set out here in the collection, and we have, like I said, many varieties, and it seems to be a general theme, and that tells you if, if all the different varieties are behaving the same way, it tells you that was a climactic event that caused this problem, not an individual variety event, necessarily. Okay. And uh, so that's happening. And you said this is the first time you've seen something like this happening in a long time. Yeah, this is the first time in a long time uh, that we've seen such poor fruit set. I mean, I don't even remember when we didn't have good fruit set, at least on the Tommy, uh, this tree over many, many years. Um, so, yeah, this is sort of a, an unusual year. And when you drive around and look at the production area, you don't see a lot of fruit set. And that just doesn't mean it's a late season. It means this isn't going to be a good season, right? That's right. It's, we're just probably, at least we're not going to have a very good season. There may be some groves and some other locations. I was just talking to a, a grower and he said his fruit set is very, very low, not very good. And that's what I was uh, wondering because you're down here in South Florida. What about somebody like in West Palm Beach or you know, land, not a land that's a little high, but somebody yes. in West Palm Beach, yes. will that be uh, like, how far of a difference, like an hour of difference with that climate, an hour of difference way make a difference in this possibility? Yeah, so depending on their location, if, if somebody, let's say in Palm Beach County, if they happen to be very near the coast, they may not have been affected because they probably didn't get down as cold as we did uh, or for as long as we did. However, inland, I would suspect that the cold uh, probably has had a greater effect, yes, because they had longer, probably more cold hours and longer cold hours. Um, but again, if you're near the coast or let's say south of Lake Okeechobee, you may not have been affected as much. And as we were uh, discussing with the insects or the flies and the bees, uh, anything, the, the, the 5, 5G that's out now, uh, the radio waves are killing, they say, the, the bees. I don't know about the flies, but it just so happens that they're expanding 5G all across the country now. and this year we happen to have such a low set. You think it's strictly weather, it might not have anything to do with that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know anything about the 5G effect, and I don't think we'll know if there is any 5G. I don't know anything about that. 
I think it's strictly a, a weather phenomena and the timing of the bloom and the cold weather. Now, you being a research center here at Trek, is that something you look into things like that? Or, or you wait year after year, and if you see nothing changing, then you figure out, well, this is when this happened, and that's when that happened, so let's look into it? Well, we pay attention to the weather and to the phenology of the trees. So what is the weather like, like during the flowering, during the bloom, during the year, and, and how does that help us explain why the tree tree may not flower or my, why the tree doesn't set fruit or why the fruit quality is not good. So we do look into that, yes. Well, what about all these like genetically modified bees that they're supposedly uh, opening up and letting now in certain parts uh, of the, I don't know this country, but at least somewhere they're, they're gonna let be out there. I mean, can that affect the fruit set as well? I am not familiar with any genetically modified honeybees um, that I'm aware of. Um, and so I, I really don't know what to say about that. Of course, you know, anytime, uh, even traditional breeding of, let's say, bees can have an effect on the bees that may be un unintended, whether it's done, you know, genetically modified um, in a laboratory or whether it's, it's just a natural breeding program. I really, I really don't know. And I think we discussed this last time I was asking you, speaking about genetically modified, is there any talk at all about mangoes being genetically modified in the future, or there's nothing to discuss that at this point? Not that I'm aware of. First of all, mango uh, tissue culture uh, is, ver is, is not an easy task. Um, it's a difficult procedure. Um, there, it has been done. Um, trees have been grown, but it's not like a mass production type, type of thing. That, I mean, uh, you'd have to look way, way, way out in the future somewhere if, if anybody was going to attempt that. As far as I know, that's really a non-issue. Okay, okay. I know in uh, Malaysia, they years ago, they were working on a, a new variety of dune that didn't smell. I don't know if it was genetically modified or not, but they're always trying to... Probably it wasn't genetically modified. It was probably just a mass selection where they were uh, looking at, you know, thousands uh, seedlings, of yeah. seedlings and found some that, that didn't have much of an odor, um, which, you know, you can do that. And in fact, that's what people do with mangoes. Now it's becoming more sophisticated. Uh, one of our researchers, Dr. Chambers, has a breeding program in mangoes, but they're using genetic markers to look in the genes to figure out which variety to, to cross with which variety. Uh, and, and, then produce, and then produce the seeds that they want, and then they can identify the genes. You know, this tree has the genes we want or this doesn't, but it's not genetically modified. How many mango trees do you have here? This planting is five acres. There's probably close to 600 trees in just this planting here. I have another five acre planting in the north that's mostly Kit, but I also have a little bit of Kent, Kensington Pride, Van Dyke. Of the ones in this planting, are they, uh, of the 600 trees, how many varieties would you say you have? We have somewhere about 180 varieties right now, right now. And we have anywhere from one to three or four trees of each variety, just depending. And it was started, actually this planting was started by uh, Carl Campbell uh, back in 1972. It was started. Um, and of course, over the years, storms and things like that took out trees. And so we have been replacing trees as, as they've been lost. And uh, how old is this tree behind you? Or how old are your trees here in this planting for the most part? The older trees? The older trees. Well, since 1972. Is that a relationship to Richard Campbell? Carl Campbell? Yeah, Carl Campbell is Richard's dad. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. And yeah. what's your latest research on bacterial black spot? Well, I'll tell you, we're not really, I, we don't have an active research program in it other than taking uh, observations that what variety seems to get it and which varieties don't. And that really is coming from uh, friends and collaborators uh, to our north. Um, some of the growers up there and some of the nurseries up there have done a lot of observation and trial and been trying to grow you know, many varieties and they have noticed which varieties seem to be susceptible and which don't. And so we've been relying on, on their observations and we've been, you know, things like that. And there's also some work that's been done in the literature. Um, we're not really investigating uh, that bacterial black spot um, so far as, um, let's say, a trial or anything like that. Now, we are interested in if there are any conventional or organic products that may uh, 
control it. Um, however, controlling bacteria is extremely difficult. So uh, it's more about, you know, if this variety is susceptible, you may not want to plant that variety, in, you know, at least in that area. So far, I don't think we have the bacterial black spot down here. It's mostly to our no north, uh, Palm Beach County. Um, however, as you know, things move around over time and, and eventually I'm sure it will show up down here. Now on these trees, I see some weeds. Uh, can you tell us uh, what you were saying last time about the weeds? Because I know you just mowed yep. this area, but you still left some weeds under the tree. So tell us about the weeds and what you were saying last time about right. them. So the idea, there's been work uh, on mango pollination, uh, both by other groups uh, in Australia um, and also here. We, we did some work. Dr. Carillo and a graduate student, uh, Matt Conandron, and myself, we had a project. It was his master's project to determine what was in the way of flying insects, what was out here flying and interacting with the flowers during the bloom. And there's a big list of potential pollinators of mangoes. And when you look in the literature, they list all these types of insects, flying insects, but they don't really know which ones specifically. There have been some studies where people have identified the insects that they observe. We did a similar thing, and we found that predominantly it is what we would call diptera species or fly species, and these are solitary flies. They were the most abundant uh, out here pollinating uh, the mango trees. Honeybees, not so much. They're not as attracted to, to mangoes. Now, there are groves, and I was just in a grove this year, a lot of bee activity. That's not as common as these uh, wild uh, diptera or fly species, thrips, other flying insects. And the work, the research has shown uh, in other areas that when you have native pollinators, and you have honeybees, you get the best fruit set. And that native pollinators are very, very important for mango uh, pollination and production. And what does that have to do with the weeds under the tree? And Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> bring me back. Okay, so the idea is that we allow, after the season is over, we allow the grass and the weeds, both uh, the, the native and non-native weeds, to grow in the rows and under the trees. And the idea is this is a habitat to build up the population of these natural pollinators. And so we let them, that pollinator uh, habitat grow all winter long, all the way through the bloom, because we want to have this habitat because they need nesting sites, they need food sources to build up their, pollen, their uh, populations. And so we allow that to uh, occur throughout the season. And then just recently, we figured the bloom was over. So we said, okay, so let's go ahead and mow this <coughs> Excuse me, and we will go ahead and, and control the weeds in the row eventually. But for right now, we, we just mowed it because the flowering is over. So it sounds like what you're saying is the best time to prune a tree is right after you pick the fruit until yes. blooming season. Yeah. So you're saying that would be a good time to stop mowing. Yes. And then once you uh, stop pruning the tree, then that's the best time to start mowing. Yes. No. So what, what it is is uh, you harvest the fruit, and let's say it's July that you end your harvest. So we end the harvest in July, we stop mowing, and we stop controlling the, the weeds. And we don't mow again until after the trees flower the next year. So we stopped mowing basically in the end of July or August last year, and we just mowed for the first time last week. And so all through that fall and winter, and then the flowering season of the mangoes, which is late winter and early spring, we don't mow and we don't uh, herbicide. We just let things go, let that natural pollinator population build up so that it's high enough, so it's high during the actual mango bloom. That's what I'm saying. You start, uh, you stop mowing when you start pruning is what I'm saying. Oh, right? okay, yeah, so we prune, yeah, we prune right after harvest. And which that's is, when you stop mowing. Yeah, and that's when we stop mowing. That's a good way for somebody exactly. to know. Yeah, that's a good way to know. Yeah, the yeah. only thing is you, you start mowing a little bit, uh, well, you stop pruning a lot earlier than when you stop mowing. You yeah. wait to the flowers. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, I see all your trees here, well, a lot of them, they're the same size, and for trees that are that old, they're not too tall. No. Uh, so tell us about the trimming of the trees yes. and, and how close they are and so on. Sure. So uh, did you purposely plant them these distances apart? Yes. Yeah, so we know that mango trees are, you know, in general, uh, 
conventionally can be big, big trees. And you could, they could be 30, 40, even 50 feet high if you don't prune them. Um, makes it, and, and when trees get that big, several things happen. One is the lower canopy gets shaded by the upper canopy. And eventually you lose this canopy to the ground. And therefore you lose the fruit production and all the fruit production ends up at the top of the tree. So that's one issue. The other thing is in order to spray or care for the tree, um, if the tree is much above 18, 20 feet, it's very difficult to spray uh, and care for it, whether it's nutritionals, biologicals, or conventional uh, pesticides. The other thing too is harvesting efficiency. So if I have to harvest this tree and I have to get a, a, uh, a mechanical picker to get up into, um, I've got to, you know, they can go up to about 20 feet, uh, but that takes time. It's more labor intensive. It's also more expensive. Whereas if the tree is maintained somewhere below 20 feet, I can generally harvest, if I need to, the whole tree from the ground with a picking hole. So the other, the last reason is that because, you know, like I said, we don't want to lose this lower canopy as much as possible. But the last reason is because of hurricanes. So we know that trees that are much above 18, 20 feet are much more susceptible to being pushed over or pulled out of the ground by a, a strong hurricane than if they are left somewhere between 20 feet or down. So, uh, and we learned this from Hurricane Andrew, which was a category five storm. And we did a big uh, survey uh, Dr. Bellardi, Dr. Campbell, myself, of the avocado, of the uh, all fruit groves actually, but mangoes included. And we found that those groves that were kept somewhere below 20 feet, the trees generally remained in the ground. Those groves that were allowed to be 30, 40 feet, most of the trees had fallen over. So uh, that's that's part of the reason. And the way we prune, we use mechan we, we bring in a machine that does mechanical topping and hedging. That's why the trees look sort of rectangular. Um, some people hand prune. Doesn't really matter. Hand prune or mechanical prune. The idea is that the tree needs to be kept somewhere below 20 feet uh, to maintain that lower canopy and to stay in the ground. And when is a good time? Uh, some people say Thanksgiving. Some people say time. So you start pruning right after you pick the fruit. But how late in the season is, is safe yeah. to go up to? Yeah. So that does become an issue. So I would tell you that you really don't want to be pruning the trees Okay, so let's say I'm, I'm growing kit, right? And you usually harvest kit, you know, July, August. Um, and that's a pretty good time. If you go much beyond August um, into September and October, if you prune late, which would be September, October, or later, uh, what happens is the tree, if it's a hard, you know, moderate pruning, it doesn't give the tree time enough to recover and have the shoots, the new shoots that it grows, become mature so that they can be dormant long enough to set up flower buds for the next year. So I would not suggest pruning past, let's say, late August, uh, September sometime, uh, because you may not, the shoots may not be mature enough or they may not be exposed uh, to dormancy long enough to set up for flowering the next spring. And that's what, yeah, that's, you know, we've seen this, in this case, that's not necessarily what happened here. Uh, this was just, we're not, you know, like I said, uh, a, a lack of, uh, well, I should, I should back up and say, correct myself. Probably we pruned this a little too hard on this side. And so what happened was the shoots that came out previous to this, we're not dormant enough, long enough this past winter. So that when temperatures warmed up, rather than sending out flowering panicles, they're sending out shoots. So, you know, in this case, it may be that we pruned this side of the tree too hard. Now, now when you say too hard, uh, some people say never prune a tree more than one third. Uh, is that a good right. rule or did you say, is it less or more than that? Yeah, okay. yeah. So what I'm actually talking about, I know what you're talking about, yeah. So. Like let's say you have a 30 foot tree and you want to bring it down. So the arborists recommend don't take, don't reduce the size of the tree more than a third any, any one year. So it's sort of a step process to bring the tree down. 
what I'm talking about is that when you prune these trees with a mechanical device, especially, this is what this refers to, is if the size of the shoot that you cut, so here's an example. So you see the size of this wood here, that's what we cut. So what happened is the tree reacts to that cut by sending out, you know, these new stems. And apparently, if, you, if the wood is a little bit too big, rather than uh, just putting out one flush of new growth, it may repeatedly put out more than one. And then therefore it doesn't have time to be dormant long enough and then flower the next year. And that's, I think that's what you're seeing in this little section here. You have to remember that all these trees are a little bit different. So when I ask the machine to go down the row, it may go a little bit too close on some trees and too far away on other trees. It's not, it's not perfect. Well, while we're here, I get mixed up uh, opinions to this question. You see this right here. Now you have several shoots coming out of one particular panicle here. Some people say that these trees are weaker because they're all coming out of one and it matters that these could break easily. And some people say it really doesn't matter. Yeah. What's, what's your opinion? Yeah. It's, I don't think it really matters, okay. um, especially for commercial production. Um, even if you were doing all these trees by hand, um, you might not see this because these were all cut at the same time, but you might see sections of the tree that were cut uh, showing that type of pattern. But yeah, that's, I mean, it is true. You know, if you have more than one, more than two coming out of the same place, it theoretically could be weaker. But from a commercial standpoint, I mean, we're, we're pruning these annually. Um, it's, it's not going to get so heavy that it's going to. Now, even from a private standpoint, if it's not going to matter, wouldn't it be better to have as many panicles as possible so you could have more fruit at each end right. as possible? Yeah. So, that's part of the reason um, that when people plant trees, uh, mango trees especially, that that whole idea, um, uh, Richard Campbell, Jeff Wasilewski, and others have promoted about pinching the stems of these young trees the first couple of years to make them branch, right? So here's a tree that produces its fruit on the end of the branch. Well, the more ends of branches you have, the more potential fruit. So yes, it makes sense. Uh, to have as many as, as possible. Um, yeah. So, it's, it doesn't, so it makes sense. Okay, now on that same note, uh, what do you think about the inten high intensity gardening and the, keeping the trees uh, like a bush, like Richard promotes, yeah, 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 Richard yeah. Campbell promotes? Yes. What is your opinion about yeah, that? Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, not all, th this is one of the things, you know, the mango varieties vary in how vigorous they are. So Tommy Atkins, Kit, they're considered quite vigorous trees. So it's hard to prune those and keep them small. You can probably keep them by hand pruning easily. You know, we're, we're keeping these at, you know, 15, 18 feet. Okay. Um, and they're, they're a vigorous tree. But there are other varieties, you know, Cogshaw, uh, Angie, others that are less vigorous and can be pruned uh, either mechanically or by hand, but kept small, much, much smaller. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful idea, especially for uh, homeowners, um, because you can have more than one mango variety in your yard. You know, normally if you, if you just had one mango tree, really it should take up, you know, 25 feet on each side of the tree, uh, especially if you're not pruning. Uh, but if you're growing one of these less vigorous types and you're pruning it, you could probably have two or three trees, maybe four trees in a smaller area. So yeah, no, it's it's. it's now, when a, you say the more vigorous trees are harder, is it just because you have to prune them more often, or do they actually affect the fruit? Yeah, they're react. Okay, the more vigorous trees. What I mean is, um, if I plant a vigorous variety and I plant um, a less vigorous variety, if you plant them at the same time in the same day right here, and come back a year later. Vigorous tree is now this tall. The less vigorous tree is maybe that tall. And so it, it's this inherent genetic vigor of the tree. That's part of it. And if I prune this tree, it reacts by putting out new growth very vigorously, very strong. If I prune this tree, the reaction to the pruning is much less. So it's, it has to do with the inherent genetics of just how much it wants to grow. 
Um, and so these, these other varieties that are less vigorous, you can keep them smaller longer. And if you were growing them commercially, um, you can probably put more trees in a specific area. Uh, you just have to pay attention that you're going to prune them and keep them small. And their reaction to pruning is less severe than the reaction of these more vigorous varieties. I see. Now in Australia now, they're doing the, the vines and they're keeping the trees smaller and they're doing like the trestles. Right. What's well, your opinion okay. about that? Yeah, no, I think that, you know, that's great. Um, there's trees being grown at very high density uh, in parts of Asia, Australia, other countries. Um, and they're putting them on trellises, espalier, and, and other systems. I think that's fine. That's great. It may work for them. I think one thing people have to rem remember is that there's a big cost to putting in the infrastructure. So those trellises aren't cheap. And so, and if you're going to train the trees to these trellises, that takes a lot of labor and time to do. So you need to be dedicated to that. You need to have a plan on how you're going to do it. Of course, all of this results in, does the, the cost of the trellis, the labor, and the intensive, intensive pruning program justify that cost? Can you make money? So that's really the bottom line. Um, I think here, I'm not so sure the trellis system could be economically justified. It's probably better to have a good pruning program, uh, select your varieties carefully, and then plan the distance between the trees based on the variety and your pruning program and go about it that way. Because the trellis system, like I said, they're, they're, they're very expensive. And then to maintain the tree on the trellis takes a lot of time and labor. I know a fellow who actually plants, it's not in one hole, but he plants the trees in one circle right next to each other. Uh, what's your opinion about something like okay, that? Okay, so if you're putting you know multiple trees very close to each other, um, one of the problems you'll, you could run into is the competition among those trees, especially for light. Um, and, and the more vigorous, let's say you're growing five different varieties. Um, over time, the more vigorous variety, if you, if you don't control things, is definitely going to tend to dominate and may negatively impact the production of the less vigorous varieties in that circle, let's say. So I would, you know, suggest if you're going to try that, um, you're going to really have to pay attention to the pruning program and to the distances between the trees to try to make that work. And I would assume you're going to say the same thing about these cocktail trees, the same exact yes, scenario. Yeah. Right? yeah, the cocktail tree is a great idea. Um, again, you'll probably have to pay attention to the pruning program so that one of the varieties doesn't overtake and outdo the other variety, right? I mean, it can be done, um, you know, but a lot of homeowners either don't prune or are not sure how to prune well, and so it, it can become an issue for them. And if somebody is gonna prevent, uh, uh, plant a variety of mango trees and other fruit trees as well, is it better to have all the mango trees together and the other fruits separate or have them dispersed within each other? Um, I think, I, I don't think, okay. It depends. So for some cultural practices, you might want to have all the mangoes near in one area as opposed to having it mixed up. Why? Uh, so for instance, irrigation practices. So mango trees here in South Florida, generally once they're established, don't need a lot of irrigation or watering. In fact, they do better when they're not over watered. Um, whereas if you're growing avocado trees or you're growing a banana or a papaya, a lot more water and a lot more nutrition is applied, whereas mangoes are generally somewhat low nutrition or, or targeted nutrition and that low nitrogen, whereas bananas and papayas, very high nitrogen. Avocados, more nitrogen than, than mango. So if you have them all mixed in together, there's a chance that some of the cultural practices that are good for mango may not be good for, let's say, the avocado, the papaya, and the banana, and vice versa. And if you are using conventional pesticides, definitely there could be an issue because something may be legal to use on the mango, illegal to use on avocado or banana and vice versa. So that would be the other concern. However, so far as pollination issues, I don't think you'll have a big problem with the pollination issues because we, we did actually, there's uh, Dr. Chambers looked at some of the mango trees here and where did the pollen come from to from what tree in this orchard or grove 
did the pollen come from to pollinate that fruit? And he found that the insects were traveling all over this distance. So the distance didn't seem to be a big issue. Okay. If somebody grafts a tree onto it, a top course and grafts a tree onto it, and then years later decides to uh, regraft a different variety, and they cut it back to the original one, I know when it's a new tree, you'll still get some of the original shoots. Will the original ones grow back again? So, okay, so if this, you know, if I was going to, so this is a rootstock, this is turpentine rootstock, Tommy Atkins sign. So if I wanted to change the variety of this, I wouldn't cut it back to the rootstock. I would cut it somewhere at about a three to four foot height, and I would top work those Tommy Atkins branches. And okay. so now it's a, a three part tree. It's the new right. scion, the Tommy Atkins, they call it a, a, the interstock, and then the rootstock. Now, if this was a new uh, graft, I know the old uh, rootstock would still give out shoots. After how long will it stop doing that? Because I know if it was like a newer thing, if you did this a year ago, you can cut it back and then the turpentine will come back. After how many years does it stop doing that and it's yeah. completely don't have yeah. to worry about that? Well, if I just cut, yeah. So if I just cut this back and I didn't do anything to it, you wouldn't see turpentine root sprouts come up or, or stem sprouts come up. You'll see new sprouts off of the the, the original scion, the Tommy Atkins, but not off the, the root Even stock. if you go below where you now, if you go to the rootstock. If you cut down to the rootstock, you're going to see multiple shoots of the rootstock come up. You could top work those, select those, um, and I'd say, you know, after two or three years, it would probably stop sprouting any of the rootstock, especially if you've got the new scion on top and it's covering. Should Wonderful. probably be okay. Wonderful. Well, this is an amazing uh, research thing here you're doing, and uh, and uh, so if a private grower of mangoes, what would be your top three mangoes you'd suggest in terms of? I know taste is subjective, but in terms of production and climate-wise here in South Florida, wow. these. that's a very hard question. Uh, a lot of it has to do with you know what's marketable. Um, and who is your target market? Well, not commercial, uh, private. Oh, private. Ah, well. Now, I'm not asking about taste, because I know taste is yeah, subjective, but yeah. in terms of production and, yeah. and disease resistance, what would be your top yeah, three? Yeah, uh, that's hard for me to say. Whew. I don't want to put you on the yeah, spot. you're putting yet, me so, on okay. the spot. I'm not All sure. Right, okay. <laughs> what would be top three to avoid? How's that one that, like, that you've seen the work? Um, well, top three to avoid if I'm, you know, if it's a dooryard planting. Um, you know, probably Tommy Atkins, I probably wouldn't plant that, even though it's vigorous, it gets a lot of fruit, it's a pretty fruit, but the quality, internal quality is just not that great. So I would probably look for some of the newer varieties that are out, uh, you know, some of the Zill varieties that have been done, but also some of the traditional or older varieties I mentioned to you before, you know, Betty Grew. Cogshaw, Angie, some of these others sure. that have been identified as good quality um, and go for those. Sure. So what would be two others? Uh, Tommy Atkins, two others that you would, would recommend people stay away from? Ah, uh, boy. Uh, well, <laughs> um, well, there's a lot of varieties that aren't very good. You know, Anderson is one. Um, what else? Well, in general, seedlings, you'd tell people to yeah. shy away from, I, right? Yeah. So unless you're growing something that comes true to seed from, you know, polyembryonic that comes true to seed. Yeah. I would avoid growing seedlings. Uh, first of all, it's going to take you four plus years before the tree ever flowers. Plus, because it's a seedling, it's going to be even uh, a little bit more vigorous in general. Um, and you don't know what the fruit's going to be like. It, you know, you could at the end of five, six years and it's fruiting and flowering and you taste the fruit and you go, oh my gosh, that's horrible. Now you either have to replace the tree or top work the tree to something you want to eat. And the varieties that come true to seed, how accurate will they come true to seed? Yeah, so that's a good question. Good question. If you, you know, we generally, we can term varieties, you know, this one's polyembryonic, this one isn't. Polyembryonic means that if you plant a seed from the polyembryonic variety, it will produce more than one seedling from that one seed. In general, it may be all identical to the mother plant, all those seedlings. However, it can be that one of those 
new shoots that comes from that seed is actually a hybrid between a pop, between a, a, another parent and that and that's a hybrid of unknown quality and 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 uh, its attributes right so if you were going to grow a polyambrenic and you took the seed and you grew it out you probably want to select uh, if let's say it had five seedlings come up from it um, in general the most vigorous one may be actually the hybrid that you don't want to plant the runt also may be the hybrid you don't want to plant so the ones in the middle, one of those is probably the one that you would want to plant. Okay, and all the new varieties that are out now, the Zill varieties and everything else, they're great, but they're not all proven, right? Because they're on the newer side. So would you recommend people have more, go with the older ones because there's just more? No, not necessarily, okay. not necessarily. Um, so there's enough information now. Yeah, about. yeah, there's, there's more information coming out. Um, and you, you could talk to the nursery uh, as well about what their recommendation would be. Um, and you have to remember too, in the dooryard, you don't necessarily need uh, in any one year, you know, 300 fruit off of sure. one tree. Uh, you may be more satisfied with, you know, 30 to 50 excellent, excellent fruit than, than 300 fruit that you just really don't like. Sure. All right, I think the last mango question of the day is, what are, uh, what are the most surprising mangoes, trees that you've seen or varieties that you've seen? Now, you didn't really expect much from them, but they really shocked you. Huh, I can't in say. In a good way. Yeah, in a good way. Um, tell you the truth, I just don't know. I don't have an answer to okay. that question. Okay, okay. There's a lot of a lot of mango trees you have here. You said over, probably on a property over 400 mango trees. Oh yeah, probably closer to 500. 500 and about what, 200 varieties? Yeah, somewhere. Yeah, and two or three of each of them. Varieties. Is it better to plant two of the same variety next to each other or it doesn't matter really? Um, okay, so, you know, we don't know a lot about what is the best pollinator varieties for specific varieties. So I can't really answer that question other than say that if, if you have two varieties that are different that flower at the same time, you're increasing the chances of cross-pollination, which in general increases the percent fruit set. Um, however, we, I can't tell you, oh yeah, if you're gonna plant Cogshaw, you definitely have to plant Angie. You know, I, we just don't know that. Okay. Now generally, you know, if there's mango trees in the neighborhood and people have different varieties, that's a good thing because the insects are moving around. Okay. So when like avocados, it's more information because you got the A and B and you also know when they flower. So it's a little bit more information. Yes. Yes. Great, great. Well, thank you. Thank you sure. for showing us the mangoes here. Wonderful here. And are, are these organic or do you, do you experiment with different sprays or do you just do the same thing all the okay. time? So this has been used uh, in, as a germplasm repository for the, gene for the uh, genetics and the breeding program. But also the entomologists look, looks at the insects the plant pathologist looks at the diseases. We are not growing these organically. This is being grown more conventionally um, at this time, at least. So yeah, no, we're more of a it's a more of a conventional operation. Although, like I said, we are doing the pollinating, uh, the pollinator, uh, and allowing the weeds and, and trying to increase the native. Besides the, the the experiments you're doing on the mangoes and the trees, what happens with all the mangoes here? Okay, good question. So in general, um, we are allowed to sell some of the fruit if it's not been in an experiment where you couldn't harvest the fruit or, or eat the fruit. And so we do uh, sell the fruit. We have one person that we work with um, that has all the proper documentation that they can sell the fruit for us. The money we make on that, we plow it back into the planting, the fertilizer, the pest control, the topping and the hedging. Uh, it goes right back into the plant. All right, wonderful. Well, I'm going to put all your contact information below. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody, that was Dr. Jonathan Crane. I told you he has so much information about mangoes. Uh, check him out. His contact information is below the video. And I, I pray that this video helped you. Please remember to like and subscribe to this channel. And if you have comments or questions, post them below the video. Until then, everybody, have a great day and keep growing.